This is Eddie Muller. I am uh, coming to you in the first installment of Ask Eddie from the Film Noir Foundation. I am here with my colleague, Ann Hawkins, who is the Director of Communications for the Film Noir Foundation, handles all of the social media stuff that we do and more. Uh, Ann, I am so happy that you set this whole thing up for us and promoted it and collated it all and got it all together. So we are going to be able to, uh, in lieu of the fact that we don't really have festivals right now, uh, and I'm kind of missing that interaction with the fans, uh, we figured this would be a nice thing to do. Charlotte there is jumping in, the, the evil cat, as you described her, <laughs> has decided this is her, you know, 15 minutes of fame. Yeah. Uh, yeah, don't don't worry about it, Ann. It's cool because I'm a, I'm a total cat person, so I think that's that's great, buddy. My guy will probably come in here and jump on me before too long. Um, anyway, uh, thanks a million, Ann. And uh, Ann is good. So here's how it's going to work. Ann is going to actually act as the moderator tonight, and she is going to uh, pepper me with all the questions that people have sent in, uh, and and we'll get some good give and take here, I hope, but uh, the deal is if you're watching this streaming on Facebook, don't send any questions as you're watching it uh, because we won't be able to get those. Feel free to send a question to askeddie at filmnoirfoundation.com and we'll get to it the next time we do one of these, probably next month. Okay, Ann, are we ready to go? We're ready to go. So, and you've kind of brought this up already, but I think one of the biggest questions people had was when will we be holding North City Festivals again? And are we going to be adding to the cities we already visit? Okay, well, yeah, that's a that's a twofold question, right? Yeah. Um, I wish I had an answer uh, to the first question, when we're going to start again. I mean, everything is obviously uh, up in the air. Uh, I would love to have a Noir City Festival in San Francisco in January of 2021, but who knows what the world is going to look like at that point. So we are exploring um, a lot of alternative ideas uh, just in case the cinemas don't reopen. I will say this, I stick with us and, and keep in touch with the social media stuff because I would love to know, um, you know, people's feelings about this. If, if say in August for uh, Noir City Chicago, which was slated to be in late August, if that did happen at the Music Box Theater in Chicago, how many people would actually attend? Uh, I'm, I'm really curious to know if people feel comfortable, not comfortable at all, uh, what their level of security is, uh, it's so very hard to predict this stuff. Now, as for the, as for the other question about adding to it, obviously we're not going to add if we don't even have the festivals in place that we've had for years. Uh, but there are constant um, candidates uh, for additional venues. Uh, we have talked to people. I know there uh, I, I saw, I took a little sneak peek at some of the questions and I saw that people are asking about, uh, you know, Florida and they were asking about, they always ask about New York yeah. and um, uh, th there are a number of venues in new cities that are in negotiation. That, that's about all I can say. So, uh, and three of them seem particularly in play um, in Florida, New Jersey, and New York. So um, it's, we'll see what happens, right? And, and you know, it's not like we're alone in these decisions because uh, the venue operators have to be on board as well. And so, you know, they are our partners in the theatrical side of what we do. And, uh, and so their opinions about this and their, the precautions that they're taking play a big, part in, uh, in what we decide to do. Um, and then another question that came up multiple times are questions about film restorations. Um, one was about, I love trouble. Is that on the radar for restoration? And are there plans 
uh, to screen uh, the double thumbs a ride and someone else asks, you know, can it be restored? Oh, okay. Uh, okay, I Love Trouble is actually, uh, that is owned by Sony. Uh, I know that it, nothing hit much has been done with it. There is a 35 millimeter print of the film, so it doesn't technically need restoration. As I have uh, noted a few times before, it's, I'm not gonna say it's problematic, but films that are owned by major studios are not films that we focus our attention on uh, that highly because, um, you know, there's no point in doing that. So I'm, I'm hoping that I Love Trouble comes back in circulation. It's really a, a fun movie um, written by Roy Huggins, the guy who did Too Late for Tears. Uh, but yeah, there is a good 35 millimeter print of that film that I don't believe has the title sequence, which is the reason why it's been problematic. When we restored Too Late for Tears, we had to rebuild the title sequence at a pretty extreme expense. That was one of the costliest things in that restoration. And uh, apparently Sony, which owns the Columbia Library, uh, hasn't yet committed uh, to doing that, but I will say that Sony is, is the best among all the studios for taking care of the films in their library. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see uh, I Love Trouble resurrected at some point in the, in the near future. Uh, as for, I know somebody asked, uh, are, you, are you going to restore The Devil Thumbs Are Right? Yeah. Um, we have. <laughs> uh, we, the, the Devil Thumbs Are Right has been restored in association with the Library of Congress. Um, the Film Noir Foundation paid for the complete sound restoration of the film. Uh, the original negative, the restoration was done from the original negative, uh, which was deposited at the Library of Congress by the film's owner, which is Warner Brothers. The issue here is um, we restored the film, but we cannot show it in North America because uh, Warner Brothers has not cleared the underlying literary rights on that title, which is, it's based on a novel by Robert Dussault, and they, they haven't been able to locate the heirs of the Dussault estate uh, to ensure that if the film was released, there wouldn't be any potential lawsuits or anything like that. Oddly enough, um, you know, Warner Brothers does not have the rights to this film overseas. So I can show the film in Europe and I can show the film elsewhere, which I did. Uh, it was featured at the Il Cinema Ritrovato Festival in Bologna last year uh, and, and was quite popular. It was part of a Felix Feist uh, retrospective that I presented. So we're just hoping that at some point, something happens to clear up that underlying rights situation and the film can actually be shown uh, in the United States. So until that happens, you're not gonna see it at festivals, you're not gonna see it on TV, uh, and there isn't gonna be a Blu-ray or DVD release. Uh, I, I know this kind of upsets people, but the reality of the situation is uh, what a company like Warner Brothers, and they're not the only ones that has this issue, what they would spend in legal fees clearing these rights, they don't actually think they're going to make that back uh, in, in DVD sales or Blu-ray sales or any of that stuff. So certainly they're not going to make it back in, uh, you know, film rentals because we're, we're probably the only outfit that would show the movie, yeah. right? Uh, and, and we just can't make them that much money. So uh, it's, it's problematic. Uh, but but that's the issue, and it's something that I really hope, you know, we'll, we'll get more clarity uh, in the future. Uh, you know, may, maybe as we go along, if other questions pop up, I'll go into it a little further about the Supreme Court decision that led to all of this, because that's a question that I get all the time. Why don't you ever show this? Why don't you ever show that? And, and 10 times out of 10, it, it is rights issues, uh, and they have to do with the underlying source material on which the movie is based. Yeah, because I think that happened with The Great Gatsby, the version with Alan Ladd, didn't it? A absolutely, because the Fitzgerald estate just, you know, gave them the rights for a certain period of time, and then when that lapsed, they, they did not renew the rights. So 
that's absolutely you're right the gatsby is one that i would love to to screen i mean we've screened it theatrically but it's totally different to try to get it broadcast or put into a, a, a product published as a dvd or a blu-ray or streaming all those rights are separate and they're all different and different terms apply so uh there's no one size fits all thing for these movies yeah and with gatsby i actually when i lived in seattle i could get a canadian tv station i actually have recording from when it played late night in canada and then i've never seen it anywhere else except for when we screened it yeah it's actually interestingly enough it's easiest to get the rights to show the film theatrically yeah. because it's a limited audience on a limited time it's like this night we're showing this film to this many people you can deal with that but if you're saying we're going to produce a whole new product from this material you know then it's units sold or streaming it's like how do you know who's recording it when it's streaming and so that it, it's far more complicated in those instances than just showing it theatrically which is why the film noir foundation you know we we our bedrock has been theatrical exhibition because we could do it yeah you know for for many years that we showed 35 millimeter film and that was it like you had to come to the festival to see these rare movies and now recently you know in our partnership with Flickr alley we're be we're able to put the films out on blu-ray and dvd and fortunately in some instances i'm able to partner then with uh, turner classic movies and show those restorations on noir alley uh but it, that is not easy to work out <laughs> uh it can get very very complicated so um i know we live in an era when people think they should be able to get everything they want to see instantly uh, but it, it really isn't that easy. There's a lot of complicated stuff that goes into it and, and a, lot of, a lot of potential litigation, which we yeah. want to avoid as much as possible. And sort of related to this, I had actually two different people ask about uh, why isn't the 95-minute version of They Won't Believe Me available and that the shorter <laughs> version is always what plays. Yeah, that's interesting because... Yes. Uh, a lot of people like me love that movie. They won't believe me, the RKO film from 1947. Uh, yeah, there is a longer version of that. I have seen it, uh, but I saw it in a 16 millimeter print in the Belgrade Film Archive. So, so it's not, you know. So I, I do know that such a version exists. Uh, it, it's not massively different, uh, but it would be nice to have that restored for the US market and uh, it's there, it's there. But then again, um, it, it's a question of uh, what is the return for the studio? Warner Brothers owns it. What is the return for the studio to go to all the trouble of restoring this film uh, when they don't really know how many, I hate to use the term, but I'm gonna say it, how many units uh, of this film they're actually going to be able to sell, which is the only way they can, you know, amortize uh, the cost of, of doing this restoration. So, it, you know, it's a dollars and cents kind of thing. But on the upside, I know that the original negative exists. I've talked to the archivist, Ned Price, uh, who had it on the list of potential projects. And unfortunately, Ned Price has retired. So uh, I'm not entirely sure whether, uh, you know, Ned's replacement uh, is, is as sensitive uh, to the value of that film. I mean, let's face it, you know, every time a hundred more movies come out, the possibility of films from 1947 being restored uh, drops a hundredfold in a sense, you know, so, um, not to be negative because that's why the film noir foundation is here is to you know not only do the restorations but to, to work very hard at convincing uh studios that that there is an audience for these films yeah i think it's 
good that you pointed that out because sometimes when I'm talking to people about restorations, they're surprised by how much of the time and effort is really in getting the elements or getting people to agree to do it and those things. That that's a, a big part of this process. It's not just actually getting the work physically done. Oh, absolutely. What, once you have everything, the work actually, I, I'm not going to say it's easy. It's very, you know, they're, they're craftsmen. I, I can't do it. I mean, I rely on the people who know what they're doing. But it's, it's finding the best elements, and it can be anything from the original negative to a 16 millimeter print. And then you have to ask yourself, you know, how much can we realistically afford to spend restoring this film based on how many people really want to see it, how many people will come to a theater to watch it. And obviously that's a whole new challenge for us. We knew what those numbers were in January. We don't know what those numbers are now in terms of theatrical exhibition. Uh, it, it's been phenomenal that people continue to donate to the foundation just to kind of keep things moving. You know, we do have other restorations in the pipeline but as you say, Anne, the, the tricky part is finding the best possible elements to do the restoration, making sure that you can um, exploit the restoration once it's done, that there's no entanglements with rights, or suddenly somebody comes out of the woodwork and lays claim to this film, and suddenly what you expected to be a certain return, you're sharing with somebody else, and, and it really wasn't as profitable as you'd hoped it would be. Uh, th these are all things we really have to take under consideration. Yeah, I, uh, thank you for answering that because I, I really like people to understand the whole process. Um, so, and you know the person who asked this question. Um, may I suggest who ki who killed Teddy Bear for a fu future festival screening? And that's from Mike Thomas. He's a former operator of the Strand Theater. Yes, Here's indeed. Just going Market Street. Yes, indeed. I I I met Mike when I when I was a teenager, with Mike and Gary Meyer, who were both getting into film exhibition back then. Uh, yeah, Who Killed Teddy Bear is about the sleaziest movie from that era that I've ever <laughs> seen. With with Sal Mineo really really working his rough trade act in that movie, yeah. and uh, you you know I, it, it's funny there are there are several movies. <laughs> pardon me, that people ask about that are, are kind of a, a crossover between sexploitation films and, and noir. Yeah. You know, so stuff like Who Killed Teddy Bear and Satan in High Heels and this kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I would not hesitate to show it. Uh, I, I, in fact, I think uh, I'm showing Odds Against Tomorrow uh, on, on TCM one of these days, and uh, the guy who shot, which I love, the guy who shot that movie is also the DP on Who Killed Teddy Bear, Joseph Brunt. Uh, so th the film has a lot to recommend it. It's just a it, deeply, deeply sleazy and disturbing movie. <laughs> so thanks, Mike. I'm glad you remembered that one. And uh, I think Mike had something to do with a 35 restoration of that film a few years ago. Yeah, and I also... <laughs> Yeah, and here in San Francisco, when we have the Nora City Festival, Sunday is always my, the last Sunday is always my favorite programming, because you tend to show stuff, like that would be perfect for Sunday. Yeah, or, or a midnight show. Yeah. A midnight show on Saturday night would be even more perfect. And uh, yeah, I, 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 it's taken under advisement. Who killed Teddy Bear? Sounds good. Um, Tom asks, uh, what NOR film do you think is most relevant during these days of pandemic and the uh, Black Lives Matter movement? Oh, uh, good, good question. That is. Um, <laughs> yeah, we should, uh, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's hard to adjust on the fly when you program stuff so far in advance, whether it's theatrical or on television or whatever. But I would definitely have done a program of um, uh, Panic in the Streets, The Killer That Stalked New York, No Way Out, and Odds Against Tomorrow uh, would have been like the quadruple bill that addresses everything we are living through right now. But they were all made 
like 60 years ago, yeah. uh, which consider that as a, if you want to think that's a very, very depressing thing, <laughs> go, go right ahead because it actually is. Yeah, that, that was kind of my reaction uh, yeah. to that. Um, it's sort of how I felt about you, when you screened the red shoes, um, how relevant that still was to how women have to choose between their artistic drives and relationships and how women are treated within Absolutely. You know, art. Yeah, that, that movie hasn't aged a day, has not aged a day. Uh, it's just incredible. And also the acting and everything about it's fantastic. Um, so another friend of ours, Nick Rossi, Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, asked, what is your favorite noir film score? Uh, well, Nick, for those who don't know, Nick has, uh, has been a featured performer at the Noir City Festival in San Francisco for the last few years, accompanying uh, Ms. Noir City, whoever she may be, whether it was Annabelle Zakaluk or Victoria Mature. Uh, Nick has been a great accompanist, uh, a great jazz guitarist in his own right. Um, I have to kind of separate this into uh, like the classic Hollywood orchestral scores. And I'm a big Miklas Rosa fan. I, I love his scores for Double Indemnity and The Killers and Criss Cross. I just, there's something about those that I find. Uh, I, I love the way Robert C. Admac uh, uses his music in The Killers and in Criss Cross. Uh, but I also love the jazz scores. So uh, John Lewis and the Modern Jazz Quartet and that score for Odds Against Tomorrow uh, never fails to amaze me. I love it. And of course, I love Miles Davis' score for uh, Elevator to the Gallows. Those, those are all favorites of mine. Yeah, and um, since you brought up Elevator to the Gallows, I think one thing that, that kind of a rumor that goes around is that, you know, like he did it all in one take or that it was all just improvised in the, in the moment and you could maybe address that. Well, my, my take on that was that uh, he was shown the film and then thought about ideas yeah. for it. And then they played the score with, with his pickup band. Um, and while the movie was showing, so if you want to call that improvisation, you certainly can. It was, it was done kind of hot and live. You know, I, I mean, they played for as long as the film ran. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's absolutely fantastic. But the idea, I think a lot of people, it's a, it's a, they get the wrong idea when it was like Miles walked in and Louis Miles said, here's my movie. And Miles pulled out his trumpet and like, created a score while watching it the first time. That, that is not what happened, uh, it, which in no way, I mean, it doesn't diminish anything. I mean, but he, he was there for a while and he thought about it. Um, you know, he was there long enough to have a little fling with Jean Moreau. So you know, <laughs> it wasn't just like one night, you know? So yeah, uh, yeah that, that great score, great score. And um, kind of a follow-up question from Alex. Uh, uh, what's a film noir score that you think is underrated? Mm. And are there composers that deserve more attention? Huh, underrated. Well, I don't, I don't have one that pops into my head right off the bat. I do think that Roy Webb, who scored a lot of stuff, uh, is kind of underrated. I, I, I you know... Um, the RKO stuff that he did is is really fantastic, um, but um, you know I, I don't know that's that's a tough one. Um, I've all, I'm going to admit that I've only recently, like in the last five or six years, really gotten into the scoring of the classic films. Uh, I, I wasn't that deeply into it. I'm no Stephen Smith, you know, who uh, has written these definitive biographies of Bernard Herrmann. He has a new one coming out on Max Steiner. Uh, he's teaching me a lot about the value of film scoring and everything that goes into it. Um, I, I always was hip to uh, more avant-garde scores than the more classical ones. Uh, but I, I'm learning, you know. Uh, I, I, so I don't know, I don't have a particular underrated one. I'm just going to 
I like Franz Waxman's score for Night in the City very much. I like the whole soundtrack. I like all the diegetic music in that film and his score, which is only on the American version of the film, which I actually think is better than the British cut of the film. But anyway. Uh, so who are your top three favorite noir villains? And that's from Brian Bird. Okay, Brian. I top three favorite noir villains. Huh, that's good. <laughs> um, okay, let me see if I can come up with this. Uh, I'm going to say um, Clifton Webb and Laura uh, is definitely one of them. I like a witty villain. I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, obviously, Richard Widmark in Kiss of Death is he he changed everything he changed the whole landscape of movies with that performance so that that's a pretty great one and um i i guess i have a hard time thinking of her as a villain because i don't want to just be exclusively male centric here so i'm gonna say peggy cummins and gun crazy uh you know i i don't really i have a hard time thinking of that as a villain even though she's murderous and yeah uh but I, you know i love her i love her in that so i'll go with that i'll say uh, what and what a dinner party that'd be huh <laughs> with the, the three characters yeah <laughs> yeah the Wal waldo lidecker uh tommy udo and Annie Laurie Starr, all all at your dinner table. That would be good. We'd serve, we'd serve, uh, you know, raw meat or so raw meat for Tommy. And I would love to. I would love to see Clifton Webb commenting on everybody else's table manners. That would be. Yeah, good. that's where my mind went to. <laughs> um, and this is from uh, Steve Herwood. Uh, if you could recommend one book about film noir, which one would it be? And who are some of your favorite authors on the subject of film noir? Oh, well, that's yeah. that, that would be mine, Steve. That would be my book on film noir. The only book you need. Uh, which I'm happy to say is, uh, is coming out again. I'm actually right now, today, before I did this, uh, I was working on the revised edition of Dark City, The Lost World of Film Noir, uh, which is going to be coming out in 2021. Uh, I, I'm, and it's going to be a pretty fabulous deluxe edition uh, with a lot of new photographs and several new chapters and lots of stuff. You know, it's great because um, that book got everything rolling. And then, um, but but then we started the foundation and we discovered these other movies and restored them. And those aren't movies that I included in the book when I wrote oh. it back in the, literally in the last century. So now I get to go back and include more about Too Late for Tears and more about Woman on the Run and, and Trapped and, you know, these films that got kind of short shrift in my original book, uh, I can now expand upon them uh, a little more. Uh, what what was the uh, the other half of that question? Uh, who are some of your favorite authors on the subject of film noir? Oh, okay. Uh, well, you know, it's it, it, I, I like Art Lyons' book, the late Art Lyons, my buddy, his Death on the Cheap, which was just about B noir. Uh, you know, obviously, my colleague Alan Rohde, I like his his biographies of Charles McGraw and Michael Curtiz, but those, those aren't specifically noir books. Foster Hirsch's book, Dark Side of the Screen, uh, is a classic text on the subject. Uh, but I'm going to throw you a curveball here, and I'm going to recommend for people uh, a book about film that's one of the best I've ever read that I just loved how imaginative it was. It's a book by Jeffrey O'Brien called The Phantom Empire. And that book had a huge impact on me when I sat down to write Dark City because uh, just the way he approached writing about movies was different than any other kind of criticism. It wasn't criticism. It was hugely imaginative. And he, he was conjuring up a world in which all of these things actually existed. And all these films were like real, and we were somehow able to tap into 
uh, the, the concentrated version of these stories that appear on these screens. And anyway, it, it, that book unlocked something in me creatively that allowed me to approach uh, my film noir book the way I did. Uh, you know, which is like, it's all a big city and there's all these neighborhoods and this is where the characters live and, uh, you know, giving the films much more life and, and uh, uh, agency, to use a popular new word, uh, than a lot of film criticism uh, normally allows. So I, I highly recommend Jeffrey's book. It, it's beautiful. And since we are talking about books, we also had questions about your other books, um, your novels, and if they are going to be reprinted, and The Art of Noir. Uh, well, the art, the art of Noir, uh, The Art of Noir has been reprinted by uh, Overlook Press uh, in a whole new trade paperback edition. But the answer in short is, is yes. Uh, I have gotten the rights back to most of these books. I, kn I know that it's weird because, you know, I've got the foundation, I've got a television show now. I should be completely exploiting all of this <laughs> by having all these books in print. But um, I wanted to have more control over them than I had previously. So I needed to get the rights to the books reverted to me, which I now have done. And so, yes. Uh, I actually have the rights to every book except The Art of Noir, which is still owned by Overlook, but um, all those other ones, Dark City, Dark City Dames, uh, both the novels, The Distance and Shadow Boxer, and there is a third book in that series that I'm working on. Uh, so all, all of those are in the pipeline and they'll all be coming out in the next couple of years. Yeah, and then another book people were asking about was you were working on a translation I believe of, uh, yeah. Of, of, of uh, Philippe Garnier's book, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, it's called Scoundrels and Spitballers, Writers and Hollywood in the 1930s. Uh, this is a book that Philippe, my, my, uh, my buddy, my French godfather, uh, he wrote this book back in the 80s, uh, in, but it was only published in France. And it's a remarkable book about the effect that movies had on American literature uh, and vice versa in, in the 1930s. And he explores a lot of territory that has never really been discussed before because he has the tenacity to go after uh, subjects that were kind of kicked to the curb by other researchers. <clears throat> and it, it's absolutely fascinating. So I'm happy to say that book is actually going to be out next month uh, through through my own publishing company, Blackpool Productions. And uh, it's a it's a handsome tome. And uh, yeah, so anybody who's interested in that, and I, I already know that uh, Turner Classic Movies is giving me a a program based on this book, uh, so that I can actually show some of the movies that Philippe talks about in there. And uh, it, it is really a, a unique volume that does not just rehash the same territory. He, he goes into totally new places, which is amazing considering that it's about the 1930s. Yeah. And um, I guess just a side note too, is that you also, uh, Blackpool also um, published his book on David Godus. Yes. yes, which is a great book, by the way. Um, uh, I, t I totally agree. And yeah, and, uh, yeah uh, we published uh, Philippe's David Goodis biography. Again, that was a book that he had originally published in France, but there was never an American edition. And so I decided, why not me? Right? I mean, this is how it works. Whether you're restoring films or publishing books or something, at a certain point you go, I guess I'm the one who's going to do this. Uh, and then I did my Gun Crazy book uh, about the making of Gun Crazy, uh, was another Blackpool production, and now uh, The Scoundrels and Spitballers uh, will be the third, our third offering, and, and there's obviously going to be more in the pipeline. Um, Whoever asked those questions, thank you very much for asking. Yeah, we've, uh, people are very interested in the books. Um, so from Chris, 
from Phoenix. Um, I'm interested in your take on the relationship between film noir and Westerns. Uh, do you have, do you see some common themes, any suggestions for films that mix the genre? Uh, interesting. I've had a lot of people uh, in the last few years encourage me to do a Western noir festival. Uh, and for all those people who are so deeply into this stuff that they want to go there, they want to take that detour into the Old West, the dark side of the Old West, which I love, um, you know, there are twice as many people who say, what, have you run out of noir? Now yeah. you have to do Westerns or something? Uh, everybody should just chill out because there's plenty of great films to go around. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I like, obviously in the late 40s, this was a common, was more common because that was the noir movement. And yeah. so you really saw films like Pursued, Blood on the Moon, Station West, uh, Rawhide, Ramrod. And I think all of those titles we're all from different studios. Uh, so this, this was evidence that there was a noir movement in Hollywood because it seeped into this completely different genre. And, and, and anybody will tell you that if you talk about Westerns, most people think, oh yeah, that's the, the good guys are in the white hats and the bad guys are in the black hats. And obviously a noir Western throws all that out the window uh, because, you know, that ambiguity in that gray area uh, is what noir is sort of all about. Um, so, you know, I, I, it's an interesting subject. And I think that uh, obviously in the 50s when Anthony Mann transitioned from making noir to making westerns, a lot of people naturally thought well, those are extensions of film noir. And certainly I think his films come closer than anything else for being, you know, a lot of them in color, like Naked Spur and stuff like that. But, um, you know, there, there's something to be said for it. I don't know how soon I'm gonna get around to programming uh, that series, but yeah. uh, it, it's a very interesting subject. I highly recommend uh, I, I don't know if the, the person who asked this question is a subscriber to our Noir City magazine, but Imogen Smith wrote a beautiful yep. feature article on this very subject uh, a couple of years ago in the Noir City magazine that, that was as cogent and insightful on this subject as anything that I've ever read. So uh, you can buy those back issues, you know, uh, single issues. So if you... If the person who asked this question wants to know more about it, I, I can't possibly be as eloquent as Imogen was uh, in this article. So I highly recommend it. Yeah, and if people go to um, filmnoirfoundation.org, you'll see a link there to where you can purchase the back issues. And um, there is some really great writing in them. Uh, and also, if you ever do program uh, Noir Western, I want you to program No Name on the Bullet, which I think is extremely noir. I will program it because I haven't seen it. <laughs> it's really good. You, you know, Anne, there are instances when I have done that. What <laughs> have you haven't seen? When, when I just say I'm programming this because I haven't seen it. And, and, I, and you know, full disclosure, I... You know, people know I have gone out to introduce a movie at a festival and I say, I don't have much to say about this because I haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how lucky am I that I get to do this where I can book this film and then go, you know, say now, uh, you know, I, how many people have seen this movie? And like four people raise their hands in an audience of 400. And I say, this is great. We're all going to see this for the first time tonight. Congratulations. Yeah, well, it makes it a communal experience, which of course is a great thing about going out to a festival is discovering well, something with other people. Well, now, now, Anne, I'm I'm going to have to find this movie tonight, and I'm probably <laughs> going to watch it at like two o'clock in the morning tonight. So, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs>
Also, I'm interested to see what you think. Um, so we did Phil Norris and Western. So, uh, okay, uh, from Sherm, best performance by a female psychopath, Peggy Cummings in Gun Crazy or Jody Comer in Killing Eve. <laughs> Those are my two choices. Two choices. And okay. I know one I think we'd both go for that's not on that list. <laughs> well, uh, female psychopath in a movie is hands down, it's Gene Tierney and Leave Her to Heaven. So uh, that is my choice. I mean, I gave Peggy her props earlier as the villain, you know. Uh, but, and I, I do. I don't want to get too far into this because I don't like talking about the new stuff. Yeah. Not that I don't like it and I don't, I do watch it. Uh, but that's not my bailiwick. I'm not endorsing yeah. anything. Uh, that uh, Julie Comer in Killing Eve was absolutely fantastic for the first season. And then I think they're kind of, they're kind of beating that horse a little bit. Uh, and, and I don't find the series to be as engaging as it was in the first season she is fantastic totally watchable you know but i think they just run out of ideas with that character uh and and peggy is great but gene tierney and leave her to heaven is is amazing oh. sorry uh, that was a, something just kind of interrupted me there like, <laughs> that was weird i don't know what that was um so i had uh two questions on posters on actual film noir posters one from jay which was uh which post noir posters are your favorites and then kind of a follow-up question from isaac was on if you're buying posters is well look, is it better to get linen backed or untouched oh okay uh, all right okay. Uh, okay i'll tell you very quickly uh my my poster the the poster in my collection that i covet the most or i don't covet it anymore because i own it is the uh, one sheet from Out of the Past, uh, which I love, artist William Rose. It's a, just a gorgeous poster, it, like it's so noir. Uh, but beyond that, I now mostly spend my time searching out uh, foreign movie posters for American movies. Yeah. So uh, I love Italian posters. My um, Underworld USA, Sam Fuller's Underworld USA, the Italian poster, La Vendetta de Gangster. Uh, is spectacular. Uh, I, I love French posters, I love Belgian posters, uh, you know, all, all that stuff. Uh, as for um, whether it's better to linen back or not, it depends on the condition in which you get the poster. If the poster is in perfect condition and it's not linen backed, don't linen back it. Because I don't know why collectors are all different. Some people collect because they want to own the poster and have it up on their wall. Some people collect because they want the films to appreciate uh, the films, the posters to appreciate in value. Uh, you're going to get more. It appreciates more if you have a perfect untouched mint poster that hasn't been linen backed or altered in any way is far more valuable than a poster that's linen backed. But I love the, po I don't buy the posters for, for uh, an investment. I buy them bec because I did a book of movie posters. Yeah. And, and it's like, I, I bought the posters because it was research, you know, and then I photographed them. And uh, so if I get a poster, like I have a beautiful Fallen Angel poster that was a mess and it, it was restored. You know, I had somebody restore it. Um, so, you know that that's it. it it all depends on what you're re, how, how you approach all of this uh are you in it for the bucks or are you in it for the passion and if you're in it for the passion then i say linen back buy a buy a poster cheap on the internet uh for a movie that you love that doesn't have too much damage and then get a really good restorer to restore the film and frame it and put it up in your house it's it's fantastic mario cueva is my guy uh, he does all my poster restoration now, and he, he's absolutely fantastic. Okay. Um, this is from John Sterling in New York. And this, I think this is a great question. I was happy someone asked this. 
Um, do film noir movies primarily appeal to an older age group or does interest span more or less equally across generations? What would be the appeal to younger groups of people? Wow, okay. That is a great, that is a great question. Uh, I, well, <clears throat> I'm very happy to say, John, that um, it appeals to a wide, wide range of viewers. Uh, it is not just older people. Uh, I can tell you that based on, you know, I, I don't keep demographics on people that attend our festivals. Nobody has to fill out a card, to, you know, to give us this information. I stand up in front of the audience and introduce the movie. So I'm looking at the crowd and I can tell you who's in the crowd and what the, the mix is gender wise and age wise and all that stuff. And it is a virtual 50 50 split gender wise. Yeah. And it and it runs the gamut from people in there. I mean, we do get a few incredibly hip teenagers, uh, but people in their 20s and 30s all the way up to people in their 80s. Uh, it, it's it's the, the whole range. Um, and I think that noir appeals to younger people because it's witty. It's cynical, right? It, it's not nostalgic, it's not corny, uh, and it's incredibly stylish uh, because these, these films were made when America was at the height of its swag. Yeah. I mean, this, this was it. So you get, you get this combination of America does it like nobody else in terms of the look of everything. You know, I'm not talking about the cinematography. I'm talking about the clothes, the cars, the nightclubs, uh, you know, the interior design. Everything was at the peak in America. But yet right at that peak, it was also beginning its decline, which is kind of sad to think about. But it's also like why successive generations gravitate to it because they recognize, wow, look, we, we hit the height and we started the fall at virtually the exact same time. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of what's going on for me uh, in a lot of, of film noir. And that's sort of like why the, the, the films that try to recapture it, they can't. Yeah. They can't because it was real. It was what was really happening when those original films were made. It wasn't, there was no reflection. There was an immediacy to the films uh, that still, to me, comes through. And, and I think that's what younger people are, are very hip to. And, and I'm very happy to say that some of the brightest people I see writing about film today, uh, A, are young women, because they finally are getting a voice in film criticism that they never really had before. And they're young, and they're young, and they have a huge appreciation for these films. Um, and and I, I just gotta say, when I go into classrooms, uh, which I've done many, many times to go in and talk to American history classes about the film noir era, or I go into a film class or a creative writing class or something, I am gonna tell you that it is the, the young women who are carrying the torch. Sadly, young men, you know, younger than 20, succumb to a lot of peer pressure because they think it's not cool to be into the arts or whatever. And so they don't express any kind of interest or passion in it where the young women have no problem doing that. And they may do it at home. They may watch the movies later, you know, but in the classroom, the, the guys sadly give in to that peer pressure of like, ah, no, no, this is old boring stuff and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, but there's then there's always the one guy who, who approaches me later and says, I love this stuff and blah, blah, blah. You know, so anyway, now, that was a little detour I took there, but, <laughs> but John, John's question inspired me because it, it, it's really important because obviously we do everything that we do 
for younger people. I mean, I'm not really doing this to so the guy can come up to me and say, I saw this when it first came out at the Bijou Theater, blah, 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 and I was 14 years old. I'm happy that the guy gets to see it again, but honestly, I'm doing it for the 14-year-old today. That's why I do this stuff, because I want them to understand the history and the continuum and the tradition and the value of great storytelling and just history to appreciate what's gone before. That's why we do this, right? So I'm after that younger audience. And uh, it, okay, I'm, I'm going to get off the soapbox now. Okay. Um, and this is from Howard Davidson. In many films where the protagonist goes to a bar or a restaurant, there's some chanteuse and piano player or band doing a song. Sometimes these numbers seem to comment on the theme of the film. Do you have a favorite song and or favorite singer who appears in, who appears in these scenes? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah, the chanteuse is like a, a, a classic figure in noir. Uh, and um, it, it's, Howard asked that question. Is that right, Howard? Good. Yeah, Howard. Good, good one, Howard. Um, and I'm going to, uh, like I did with Imogen, I'm going to throw back to uh, the very first issue of the Noir City magazine that we did uh, with art director Michael Cronenberg. Vince Keenan had a story in that issue called Songbirds of Noir that was about this very uh, subject. All, all of the women who sang in noir, who doubled them, who, who actually sang the songs, uh, which ones were best integrated into the movies, all that kind of stuff. But I will tell you that my absolute favorite uh, is Hatta Brooks in In a Lonely Place, oh, when yeah. she sings at the piano bar for Bogart and Gloria Grant, Till There Was You. Uh, that, that is the best uh, use of a singer in a club commenting on the action and being part of the scene. Uh, that is one of my, that's my favorite movie and that is maybe my favorite scene in my favorite movie. So Hatta Brooks is the answer to that question. And a, a follow-up question since you did bring up In a Lonely Place, why don't you ever screen it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Ann. Uh, okay, so I, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know who asked that question, but I'm going to say thank you very much for attending the party as late as you've come. I appreciate it because uh, I have shown In a Lonely Place more than any other movie, both theatrically and on TCM. I have shown that movie, I think it's six times and counting just on Turner Classic Movies. And then um, at the festivals, oh my God, I can't, yeah. I can't even count how many times I've shown In a Lonely Place. So um, uh, there, there, there you have it. Okay. <laughs> this is from Andrew from Austin, Texas. Um, do you know anything about a biography of Mickey Cohen that Ben Hecht supposedly wrote but never published? Uh, yeah, I, I have heard about that project and I, I know that uh, it never happened because Mickey uh, you know was savvy enough to do his own book I don't I, which I actually I'm not going to bother to read but it's actually that pink book back there on my bookshelf is uh, Mickey Cohn in my own words uh, which is a pretty cool book uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm sure that's why uh, that the Ben Heck book never happened because Mickey was uh, was going to do it himself. Hey, um, this is from Roland Jefferson. Do you have a restored print of Dorothy Dandridge's only film noir, the 1961 Malaga starring Dandridge, Trevor Howard, and Edward Purdom? Okay, this is, uh, yeah, this is a good question. Uh, this is a movie that I would love to restore and that I would love to see back in circulation, very, very timely. It's a heist picture and also uh, features an interracial romance between Dorothy Dandridge and Trevor Howard, and it was made in like 1960, so um, it would really fit in with that whole Odds Against Tomorrow era thing. Um, it, it, the movie is owned by Warner Brothers, and they, they need to do something with it. 
uh, it would be great to see it reissued on Blu-ray or DVD. So uh, thank you, Roland, for the question. It needs to be pushed. Uh, as, as I said, um, I don't like to get into spending the Film Noir Foundation's money restoring films that are the property of major entertainment conglomerates. Uh, it, it seems like money misplaced, if you know what I mean. Uh, but I will certainly uh, be using what leverage I have uh, with said conglomerates uh, to, tr to try to get that film back in circulation because uh, it, it would be great. She's terrific. It's a good movie and she's terrific. Right. And um, trying to decide her <laughs> on our last question. Um, well, I had the question, someone asked, um, who, what actor would you most like to have a scotch with? if you could, from <laughs> our era. Okay, that's an, that's an interesting question because it presumes two things. It presumes I'm a scotch drinker, which I'm not, because <laughs> this is bourbon. And it presumes, I think, that I'd want to have that drink with an actor. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to say, uh, unless we're just using the generic term actor to represent both genders, uh, I'm going to say, I've had those drinks, I'm pleased to say, because uh, when I did Dark City Dames, uh, I drank with Jane Greer and Audrey Totter and Marie Windsor and Colleen Gray and Evelyn <laughs> Keys and Ann Savage, uh, and, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that uh, it, it was a very satisfying experience, and they, it was wonderful. I didn't actually, they're all very different, but it was really fun to go to like cocktail lounges and drink with Evelyn and Ann. I mean, that, that was kind of fun. I mean, I, ne I never really did that with Jane or Marie or Audrey or uh, God knows, not Colleen. She probably would not go to a cocktail lounge. We did, we did drink hard liquor in her home. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, Anne and Evelyn would actually go out and like, take me to a bar. Let's go drink, you know. Uh, that, that was great fun. So, yeah, that, that's, that's my answer to that question. So are we going to wind it up, Ann? We're winding it up. I felt like that was the perfect question to go out on. Okay, very good. And, you know, if people uh, submitted questions and we didn't get to them, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll probably do this again. I'm pretty sure we'll do this again. Yeah. This, this is like a – I'm not going to say it's a trial run, but it's the first one out of the gate. And so we'll see how, how many people are into it, how many people react, uh, whether we went too long, we didn't go long enough whatever, and, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping we'll get uh, a lot of feedback, and, and we'll do this again. And, uh, and people can, you know, um, comment on our Facebook page, or Instagram, or uh, Twitter, you know, if they, and also we take private messages as well on those, you know, forums, if you want to give us your feedback about how you thought this went. Fantastic, and of course, you know, we, we, we build this as ask Eddie anything, but seriously, there were, there were a few questions I think we got that I'm really not going to answer. <laughs> so, uh, at, at least not publicly, I'm not going to answer those questions. So, uh, you know, and, and also just as a, a brief disclaimer, uh, this segment that we do is presented under the auspices of the Film Noir Foundation, yes. not, not Turner Classic Movies. So uh, if you have specific questions about why don't you show this on Noir Alley or that, or why doesn't TCM do this, I'm just not going to answer those questions in this forum because this is me 
as the founder and president of the Film Noir Foundation, Ann Hawkins, director of communications of the Film Noir Foundation. Uh, so, so that's uh, what our, where our interest lies and those are the questions that are gonna get priority. Uh, so just folks, just bear that in mind going forward. Okay, Ann, thanks a million. You're uh, welcome. You're the greatest and uh, I hope we do this again very soon. Me too, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Hopefully everybody else did.